And now I would like to do some, I'm having technical difficulties as well as I needed to turn on my mic. So anyways, does anybody know what this weekend is? It's our first weekend of real live baseball. Yeah, I'm pretty excited. The Tribe is playing today and I can sit out in my patio and watch the games. Go Tribe. So anyways, let's get on with the announcements. I would like to announce that the Nest Early Learning Center, run by our own Ann Ryman, is considering running a class for online students that you can come in kindergarten through third grade and be able to spend time here with a teacher and do your online work on your day that you have to do online. We all know that the school systems are a little different than they have been in the past. So she is putting a survey online. Uh, it's, it's actually, she's putting a website, uh, the survey link, and you can go to that. It will also be in the worship bulletin next week as well as the pathways. So if you are interested in being part of that class, you better sign up and do the survey quickly because she is only taking six students. Also, a reminder in the same note, the Pathways newsletter is going out this week. So if you want to have an article or something in the Pathways to mention, you need to have it to Kathy in the office by Tuesday this week. Also, the youth group flea market is this coming Saturday, August 1st, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. down in the lower lot church parking lot. So make that into your plans and hopefully we'll see you there. Also wanted to mention we now have some new chairs that were donated down in the uh, fellowship hall. They are padded. So when we have some dinners and things like that, you will have a little more cushy enjoyable seat while you were there. And those were um, also given by this must be the Ryman Day as Dan Ryman in his Scope, School, or Scope Academy in Springfield donated the chairs to us. So thank you, Scope Academy. Also, we wanted to mention that the work projects are still going on around the church. So wanted to give a big thanks to all for your time and dedication to keep the church looking great. So when everyone does come back, we will have a beautiful church, including that new parking lot. So anyways, inside and out, we are doing work all the time. Also, my last note is that we are missing the church carpet cleaner. If anyone knows, please contact Rick Lloyd and he promised not to get angry, which is my sermon topic today. So anyways, pay attention, Rick. You can get him at 330-752-3412 or call the church office. But we do need that church uh, carpet cleaner so we can uh, do some uh, maintenance around here for the carpets uh, before um, some of the other groups that are using the church get in here. Thank you. Now for the prelude.
Today's call to worship was inspired by Luke 13, verses 10 through 17, where Jesus heals the woman that was bent over for 18 years. Come all you who are struggling. Come all you who are crippled by pain and suffering. Come to worship a God who heals your pain. Come to worship a God who gives forgiveness. Let us worship God who sets us free and gives us new life. Let us continue to worship God as we sing from the chalice praise, hymn number 39, Shine Jesus, Shine. of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining jesus light of the world shine upon us set us free by the truth you now bring us shine on me shine on me shine jesus shine Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Lord, I come to your awesome presence from the shadows into your radiance. By the blood I may enter your brightness. Search me, try me, consume all my darkness. Shine on me, shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. As we gaze on your kingly brightness, so our faces display your likeness, ever changing from glory to glory. Mirrored here, may our lives tell your story. Shine on me, shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> anyway, um, it would be great to see you all back in these pews again because it's really different standing up here. This will be my last time for a while, and I really miss you guys seeing your smiling faces and praying together, singing, sharing the peace. You probably maybe even saw me pounding out the, the beat to that last song, which I'd much rather do as well and of course sharing the communion table. But virtual worship is what we have right now. So let's pray that things in the world and the wrongs in the world get better soon. 
Let us pray. Dear God, Master of all, we gather here in fellowship to honor your most holy name and worship. We pray this day that love continues its embrace on the eternal gifts of faith, hope, and charity here in Stowe, across this nation, and around the world. Enable the oppressed and captives to find freedom. Heal our sick. In your name, Lord, we seek to aid others in distress. We pray for the softening of hearts and moral revival in this nation and the world. Father, we desire your holy will over our own. We ask at this moment your wisdom, peace, and joy. With humble hearts, we come before you, united in prayer, seeking your guidance, your will, your unfailing love. Bless our lives and this service with your presence. Free us of self, O God. And we thank you for sending your son Jesus to be our master, teacher, and our savior, whom we adore and worship, and in whose divine name we pray. Amen. As we are forgiven and reconciled through Christ Jesus, let us be reconciled with each other. May the peace of the Lord be with you all, and let's pass that peace and love to those around you. May God's peace be truly seen around the world, starting here with us. I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross he suffered, from the curse to set me free. Sing, oh sing of my Redeemer, with his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. <laughs>
Excuse me, just for a second while I set up the rest of my staging. Hello, boys and girls. I hope all of you are doing very well this morning on this beautiful Sabbath day. Um, I was in my garden last night, working furiously, trying to get things ready before we leave for a short trip this next, these next two weeks. And um, uh, in, in the garden, we ha my wife and I have six gardens, flower gardens scattered around our house. And uh, she has certain flowers that she likes to see grow in each and every single one of those flowers. And one thing we notice right away, it doesn't matter how long it is, but we can go by the garden and there are weeds that start coming up out of the ground. And, and, and those weeds, you know, I, I know they're part of God's creation and everything, but they don't belong in our garden. Um, they grow too fast. They take water away from the rest of the plants that are supposed to be in that garden. Um, if we leave them alone, they will grow so large and so fast that they will actually crowd out the rest of the flowers that we want growing there, and eventually they could even kill the flowers that are supposed to be there. So our goal is to try and get into the garden once a week and take all those weeds out of there. And as I was doing this last night, pulling weeds out, oh, and I brought some tools along with me. Um, this is, I call it a mini shovel. I'm not sure what exactly it's called, but we use that to dig up the ground around the flowers and, and uh, help loosen up the soil to get the, the seeds out, or the, the weeds out. And then I've got this thing too. I still don't know what this is called either, but my wife knows all that stuff. I just know how to use it. And I also have that. That's kind of cool because if the ground is really hard, I can stick this right underneath the root of the, of the weed and, and pry it up and the ground breaks up and it's really easy to pull the weed out. And then sometimes, I also wear my gloves, okay, so I don't get my hands dirty. Not that I'm a, afraid of getting my hands dirty. I really I don't mind that at all. But as I was doing this yesterday, I was thinking that the weeds in our garden are a lot like the sin in our lives. You know, weeds don't belong in our garden. And sin doesn't belong in our lives. Like weeds, sin keeps us from the image or the idea that God has in his mind for each of us. It actually separates us from him. It sets a poor example for others as well, which separates them from God. And it just keeps us from growing into the person that God intends us to be. Well, what are the, some of those weeds or sins in our lives? Well, anger, for one, and uh, Jim uh, Ken Hindle is going to be speaking on that a little later on. Uh, disobedience, uh, when, we, um, uh, when our parents tell us to clean up our room and we don't, I don't think that's exactly what God has in mind for us, okay? Being unfriendly or getting into fights with our brothers and sisters, that's not exactly what God has intended for us either. So those are weeds that can crop up into our lives. So here I am pulling up weeds, thinking about it, and I'm thinking, you know, if sin in my life is a weed, who pulls those weeds? Well, who do you think is in your life that God sent as a gardener to pull the weeds, the sin, to remind you what's right and what's wrong? And if you said your parents, very good. I want you to kiss your brain. You're pretty smart. Maybe you said your grandparents or an aunt and an uncle or a teacher or Pastor Jonathan even. If you said one of those, pat yourself on the back. That's the right answer too. You know, it's very, very important that we recognize what is a weed in our life and what doesn't belong. And so we ought to thank each and every single one of those people who are watching over us, who are helping us to grow into the kind of person that God wants us to be. So before we, or after we pray, I would like you to run over to your mom or your dad or whoever you're with today for this worship service. Give them a big hug and say thank you. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, 
Thank you for having a plan in our lives. Thank you for helping us to grow into the kind of person you would have us to be. Thank you for loving us so much that you sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins. We ask, Lord, that you would bless each and every single one of us and help us to grow into the person that you want us to be. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, well, speaking of a bad example, <laughs> <laughs> for the last time, I keep the stewardship challenge lighter with a bit of humor, so bear with me. I thought you were talking about me. No, no, no. <laughs> that, was, that was on me, Chuck. Uh, later for you. <laughs> Everybody knew the roof was leaking, but the church kept putting off the replacement. Finally, some areas of the ceiling in the sanctuary began to sag. They called a congregational meeting. A very, a very wealthy member rose and pledged $10 toward fixing the roof. Just then, a small piece of the ceiling fell and hit him on the head, and somebody in the back of the church said, Hit him again, Lord! I'm not sure if it was Gene Locke, Jim Hindle, Rick Lloyd, or Chuck over here, because it wasn't me. Let us now give back to God a portion of the blessings God has given to us. Accept, O oh God, the gifts we bring of spirit and of clay. Transform them into blessings on those we serve today. Rekindle deep within us all a passion to fulfill. The ministry disciples have empowered to do your will. Let us pray. Lord God, lately I've kept a stewardship challenge light with a bit of humor because I think the world can use a little humor right now. We thank you, God, for the love you show us and for the opportunity you give us to show our love to you and for your world in return. You have brought us by your grace to this day. O oh Lord, what we offer you now is but a portion of what, we have, of what you have given us. We ask that you would bless it and accept it, with, with it, the intentions of our hearts, minds, and souls. And Lord, as we give to others in your name, keep us smiling and joyful. And in this moment, please smile down upon us especially me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I bet you're all surprised I did it again. I'm surprised too. I have to remember to turn this on. But I bet you're all surprised to see me here today. Jonathan is, is not here, so he blessed me with giving the sermon, so I'm going to give it my best shot. As I told him, it may not be perfect, but it will be faithful. Today's scripture is from Psalm 22, a great song of lament. It is about a person who is crying to God to save him and thanking God for rescuing him. We will now read from Psalm 22, verses 1 through 11. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? O oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I do not rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you, our fathers trusted, and they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued, and you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. 
All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The title of my sermon today, you can say it a couple different ways. Is it wrong to be angry with God, or is it? okay to be angry with God. Either way you want to look at it, I guess when I started this, I wanted to know the answer. Psalm 22 begins with one of the most anguished cry in human history. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Everyone remembers one of the most known verses uttered by Jesus while on the cross. Jesus was not inventing unique words to interpret his suffering. Rather, he was quoting from Psalm 22.1. These words were actually first uttered by David, and David was speaking for all God's people. We need to reflect on these words and the whole psalm as they relate to Christ and to all his people in order to understand them fully. The psalm begins with David praying, my God, and David expressing his own experience of feeling abandoned by God, and that he feels that God does not hear him and does not care about his suffering. But then David remembers this is his God. He is near and listening. He prays to God, stays with his faith, and finally he praises God. Being angry at God is something that many people, both believers and unbelievers, have wrestled with throughout time. When something tragic happens in our lives, we ask God the question, why? Because it is the natural response. What we're really asking him, though, is not so much why God, is why me, God? Personally, I have asked this question many times, and I'm sure most, if not all of you, have asked this question as well. I really want to talk to you today about understanding why God would allow things to happen that don't make sense to us, not giving us the results we want, giving us a feeling of abandonment, experiences that have affected my life and how they have or may have affected yours as well, if we stay mad at God. I'd like to start off with a few of my own personal experiences. In the fall of 1982, within a one-month period, my grandfather died. My dad passed away while attending my grandfather's funeral. Followed two weeks afterward by the loss of my seven-month-old son, Jason. Why me, God? In 1983, I was blessed with a baby girl we named Lindsay. Yes, you all know Lindsay. Always smiling, cute, funny, personable. Yep, she's a Hindle, all right. Oh, come on, Faye, give me a break. Anyways, then came seizures at three months of age and the doctors telling us our new princess had a brain aneurysm. She was given two years to live. 
two brain surgeries by the age of four in New York and one at Cleveland Clinic during her 20s, a total of 24 hours of surgery that has helped stabilize the aneurysm. And as many of you know, she just recently had another surgery, five hours again at Cleveland Clinic to repair an aortic aneurysm. Why me, God? In 2004, my oldest brother, Bob, passed away from Huntington's disease at the age of 59. The same disease my youngest sister is currently struggling with. Why me, God? And in 2009, my wife and best friend, Bobby, was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. In 2014, five years after the diagnosis, one week shy of our 36th anniversary and two weeks shy of her 55th birthday, Bobby lost her courageous battle with cancer. Why me, God? Why me, God? This response indicates two flaws in my thinking. First, as believers, we naively operate under the impression that life will be easy and that God should prevent tragedy from ever happening to us. When he does not, we get angry with him. We feel abandoned by him. Tragedies bring home the awful truth that we are not in charge. Anger is simply an emotional response to such an event. We can complain, get angry, and blame God for what is happening. Yet, if we trust him and yield our bitterness and pain to him, he can and will grant us his peace and strength to get us through any difficult situation. The psalmist shows us. He remembers God is there in the Lord, and during the why me times, makes all things good and new. We can be angry with God for many reasons. So we all have to accept at some point that there are things that we cannot control or even understand with our finite minds. Second, when we don't understand the extent of God's sovereignty, we lose confidence in his ability to control circumstances, other people, and the way they affect us. Then we get angry with God because he seems like he has lost control of the universe, and especially control of our lives. When we lose faith in God's sovereignty, it is because our frail human flesh is grappling with our own frustration and our lack of control over events. When good things happen, we all too often attribute it to our achievements or success. When bad things happen, however, we are quick to blame God, and we get angry with him for not preventing it. Our understanding of the sovereignty of God in all circumstances <clears throat> must be accompanied by understanding of his other attributes, love, mercy, kindness, goodness, righteousness, justice, and holiness. When we see our difficulties through the truth of God's word, we see his perfect plan and purpose for us, allowing us to see our problems in a different light. We also know from scripture that this life will never be one of continual joy and happiness. Rather, we were, are reminded in Job 5, 7, man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upward 
and also in Job 14.1, life is short and full of trouble. Just because we come to Christ for salvation from sin does not mean we are guaranteed a life free of problems. In fact, John 16.33, Jesus says, In this world you have trouble, but that he has overcome the world, enabling us to have peace within. The psalmist tells us it is okay to be mad at God, but it is not faithful or helpful to stay angry at God. You see, anger is a result of an inability or unwillingness to trust God, even when we do not understand what he is doing. Anger at God is essentially telling God that he has done something wrong, which we know he does not do. It says in Ecclesiastes 7, verses 9 and 10, Be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Does God understand when we are angry? frustrated or disappointed with him? Yes, he knows our hearts, and he knows how difficult and painful this world can be. Does that make it right to be angry with God? Absolutely not. Instead of being angry with God, we should pour our hearts into him in prayer and trust that he is in control of his perfect plan, a plan with eternal life. The bottom line, can we trust God with everything? Our very lives, even the loves of our lives of our loved ones? Of course we can. Our God is compassionate, full of grace and love. And as disciples of Christ, we can trust him with all things. When tragedies happen to us, we know God can use them, bringing us closer to him and to strengthen our faith. That is easier said than done, however. It requires a daily surrendering of our will to his will. A faithful study of his attributes of God's word, much prayer, and then applying what we learn to our own situation. By doing so, our faith will allow us to focus on what we have. For me, that's this church. My in-laws that go above and beyond, a son, Corey, his beautiful wife, two adorable grandkids, and oh yeah, my miracle princess, Lindsay. But most importantly, God's love, my faith and trust of God, and his plan for eternal peace. Six years ago, when I lost my best friend and great wife and even better mother, I felt abandoned by God. I know I was angry and asked him often, why me, God? But I remembered what the psalmist said, that God will be with, there, be with me through all times. He is near and he is always listening. We must confess our will to God's will, our feelings of anger and frustration to the Lord. Then in his forgiveness, we can release those feelings to him. We must go before the Lord in prayer often. In our grief, in our anger, in our pain. God knows our hearts and it is pointless to try and hide how we really feel. 
So talking to him is one of the best ways to handle our grief. As it says in verse 11 of the psalm, we are not alone. God is near. We must be faithful to God, trust God, and believe in his perfect plan. For with it, we are offered eternal peace and life. Suffering and anger, yes. Punishment from God, no. Why me, God? The answer is because tragedies happen to all of us. But through our faith, we can remember in our cries of why me. God hears us, and God is already at work to make things good and new. I know because I am still here. Amen. Please bow with me now in prayer. Holy God, we confess there are times when we gather in prayer and we don't really understand why we do it, because we don't understand the whys of life. Typically, at such times, our hearts are filled with sorrow at the magnitude of loss. At such, such times, we gather with heavy hearts. We come with pain too deep for words. We come anxious and unsure. We come doubting and angry. We come in dis disbelief and disquiet. We come in shock and despair, but yet we come. We come to you, and there you are. There you are, God, ever more ready to listen than we are to pray. Mysterious God, we confess that there are some things we just cannot understand. So we ask that you would help us to know of your presence, because at such a time, it is easy for us to let go of you. It is easy for us to blame you, to become angry with you. All are normal and even understandable, but don't let us stay in such a state. Help us to realize that your love never lets go of us, that you are never angry with us. Holy God, hold us tightly as we wonder why, so that we might be comforted. Hold us tightly as we cry out to you with our questions that stem from human condition. Hold us tightly, making us ever aware that while we cry, you cry with us. For surely you know the pain and anguish we endure through the humanness of Jesus. So hold us tightly, God, cry with us, but then make us ever aware that you love us too much to ever let us remain forever in brokenness, in chaos, in pain, but that you are always at work to make all things new. Help us to find greatness for the life of love that you are always giving. May you listen now, O oh God, to the prayers we offer in this time of holy silence. This we pray in the name of Jesus, who also felt lonely and forsaken, who in the end commended his spirit to God, and who also taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now prepare for the Lord's table by singing the communion hymn, Draw Us in the Spirit Tether, number 392. <coughs> Spirit's tether, for when humbly in your name two or three are met together, you are in the midst of them. Alleluia, alleluia. Touch we now your God. disciples used to gather in the name of Christ to sup. Then with thanks to God the giver, break the bread and bless the cup. Alleluia. sacraments of you that by caring helping giving we may be disciples true alleluia alleluia we will serve We come to the table knowing even Jesus felt lonely and forsaken, who in the end commended his spirit to God. But we know he is near, listening and making things good through his perfect plan. For it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he came to the table with his disciples. There, he took a loaf of bread, and after giving thanks to God, broke it, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Take and eat, and do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took a cup, also after supper, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood, given for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you drink from this cup, do so in remembrance of me. For at this table, as we come to the Lord, where the Lord has invited us to come, we share in these gifts. For these are the gifts of God, for the people of God. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for providing this weekly opportunity to especially remember the sacrifice of your Son, our Savior. As we partake of this bread and this cup, may we sense anew the indwelling of your Spirit. May our lives reflect your word and deed, the fact that we belong to you.
You know, I had something prepared to read that's kind of like we do every week, but I kind of decided that I'm just going to wing it this morning because somebody has joined me up here. You can't see him. Well, you can't see him because it's me. I'm coming here today. It was kind of a blessing that Jonathan gave me this day to do a sermon, something I really needed to do if you listen to the sermon. I got it when I got up this morning at 3:53 a.m. Thank you Jonathan for giving me the sermon. I started thinking about what I was going to say today. And it really hit me. It really really hit me that you know, this is a great place to be. And so I finally after thinking about doing the sermon, I did the communion here three times and got it right all three times. So I thought I was ready to go. I got up like I always do, 4.30, I waited till then to get out of bed. And I looked at my phone like I always do to check out the weather, honestly to see if it was gonna be nice and the tribe would play today. But when I put it up, I had a notification from Facebook and it said, new memories. When I clicked it on, it had a picture of my two grandsons, new memories. It was such a wow moment. And then I decided to open up Facebook and this, you can't make this up. It was a picture of me and Lindsay saying that three years ago today, we were friends on Facebook. So cool. And then how Facebook, book does it starts going through all these pictures and the last picture had my family and pictures around it and the picture in the middle was of me and Bobby at Corey's wedding now that was a wow moment as well so as I come up here today I started thinking about this sermon and everything it meant to me and I want everybody to know, because everybody always says how I'm smiling and I can handle it. Well, I kind of read some books about comedians, and they don't always handle it so well. They smile to kind of hide things. And I want everybody to know I smile a lot and I do my best. But you know, I was very angry at God. I felt abandoned by God. I felt like God didn't even like me. I didn't know what to do with my life for a long time. But today, really after spending a couple weeks putting together this sermon, I know that it was the right choice for me. And I want you to always know, now when I smile, it will be true and genuine because as the psalmist said, God is always there and it is his plan for eternal life and our faith and trust in him that we need to remember. Thank you, Jonathan, for giving me this opportunity. And if you were here, I know you would ask me the question, but I will say to you, that yes, I do accept Jesus Christ as my living Savior. Thank you. strong Jesus keep me from all wrong I'll be satisfied as long as I walk let me walk close to thee just a closer walk with thee grant 
granted Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee, and let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Through this world of toils and snares, if I falter, Lord, who cares? Who with me my burden shares? None but thee, dear Lord, none but thee. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. When my feeble life is o'er, time for me will be no more. Guide me gently, safely o'er to thy shore, dear Lord, to thy shore. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. So as you go forth today, remember what the psalmist said. In times of sadness or frustration, remember that God is always there. He hears you, and he has not forgotten you. And he is already at work to make things good. May, th may the grace of God, the constant and abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, and the unconditional love of Jesus Christ. Rest and abide with each and every one of you, now and forevermore. Amen. thou hast promised to all who follow thee that where thou art in glory there shall thy servant be and Jesus I have promised to serve thee to the end oh give me grace to follow my master and my friend.